the, the global architecture. Thank you, Secretary. And I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Sanders. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, you're probably not going to miss me, but I think I'm coming back. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and Mr. Sanders, we look forward to it. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, in, in all due respect to my friends, Mr. Greenspan, Mr. Rubin, and Mr. Summers, uh, their testimony, which is similar to testimony that we have heard from them in recent years, is coming from an Alice in Wonderland perspective. It just doesn't have anything to do with reality. Uh, Mr. Chairman, whether anyone likes it or not, and I hate to break this to you, the IMF has failed and failed dismally. Given the horrendous record of the IMF in making life worse for the people of Mexico, worse for the people of Asia, worse for the people of Russia, not to mention all of the austerity programs and, and, and in Africa and Latin America and the misery that those programs have caused, why in God's name would anyone want to continue along the incredible path of failure that has been the record of the IMF. That, to my mind, would be insane. Now, Mr. Chairman, that's my view. But let me mention to you and quote the point of view of a number of other people whose opinion is, is not normally a mine. This Sunday's, just last Sunday's New York Times, and I quote, it's only a bit of an overstatement to say that the free market IMF, Bob Rubin, and Larry Summers' model is in shambles, end of quote, said John S. Wadsworth, Jr., who runs Morgan Stanley's operations in Asia. According to a Wall Street Journal editorial from July 20th, 1998, quote, the IMF helped create the very crisis that Mr. Camdesu says he now needs more money to solve, end quote. And the Wall Street Journal, not noted to be a progressive organ, that I have a lot in common with has constantly talked about the failure of the IMF and the issue of moral hazard. Now let me quote from a very important letter that we received in Congress from 126 delegates to the Mexican Congress from the PRD party, the second largest political party in Mexico, and I quote, contrary to the view promulgated by the Clinton administration and the U.S. media, the packaging of $12.5 billion from the Exchange Stabilization Fund and $17.8 billion from the IMF to bail out Mexico benefited only foreign investors and a small group of already wealthy Mexican investors while wrecking havoc on our national economy. End of quote. A letter from 140 American and international environmental groups, labor unions, and development organizations says, and I quote, the disastrous impact of IMF-imposed policies on workers' rights, environmental protection, and economic growth and development, the crushing debt repayment burden of poor countries as a result of IMF policies, and the continuing secrecy of IMF operations provide ample justification for denying increased funding to the IMF, end of quote. Let me say a word about Russia, poor, tragic Russia. When communism fell in 1991, the Russian government received the attention and the policy guidance and $20 billion from the IMF. And it is fair to probably say that never in the modern history of this world has one country which started off as an industrialized nation with an inefficient economy to be sure, never before have we seen an economy decline in seven years like the Russian economy has declined under the guidance of the brilliant advice of the IMF, not to mention $20 billion in taxpayer money. And I don't have to tell you, you know that. This is a country that used to manufacture. They don't do it anymore. Their children are hungry. Their old people don't receive pensions. They used to produce food. Now they import food. But meanwhile, they now have a handful of billionaire oligarchs who have made a fortune illegally, having a substantial role in running that country. So Mr. Chairman, it is fine for all of us in a very congenial uh, way to be laughing and chatting about what's going on, but I think we are blind 
not to recognize that the IMF has failed. And while we do not and must not turn our backs on what's going on in this world, and please do not hear me to say that, and I think, Mr. Chairman, your suggestion about thinking about providing food to Russia when this winter is coming is a very important suggestion. We must not turn our back. But any major league manager that has a pitcher who's won three games and lost 20, you know what? You say to that pitcher, thank you, you're going down to the minors. We're trying a new strategy. Your strategy has failed. So I would simply like to ask uh, Mr. Greenspan or, or, or uh, Mr. Rubin or Mr. Summers, how, given the horrendous record of the IMF in Russia, in Asia, in Africa, in Latin America, and all the suffering that it has caused to, 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 to poor people, while rich people in almost every country have become richer, how in a straight face can you come before the taxpayers of the United States and say, hey, we want $18 billion more to continue this failed policy? Mr. Greenspan, Mr. Rubin, I know. Uh, Congressman, if we agreed with your appraisal, I think we would agree with your conclusion. I think the problem is we don't agree with your appraisal. Yes, you think that the, success, that the IMF has been successful in Russia after $20 billion in guiding that country since the fall of Congress? I uh, think I stipulated the conditions under which I think they have failed or succeeded. I would not characterize what the IMF has done anywhere as an unmitigated success, but I scarcely would conclude uh, the uh, wholly negative view which uh, you have adduced. Mr. Greenspan, your testimony goes around the world very quickly. And I think that maybe the people of Russia today, who are suffering so terribly, who have seen such a major decline in their economy over I, through IMF guidance over the last seven years, would love you to tell us and tell them about the successes of the IMF in Russia. I would say that the IMF had, had very little to do with the decline that existed in Russia. I think that you start off with a centrally planned economy in which a goodly part of what they are producing is not available to be sold in the market, and that very rapidly dissolves. Uh, I'm not arguing that uh, they moved from a centrally planned economy to a free market economy. That's scarcely the case. I've argued elsewhere that, uh, indeed, uh, the type of uh, markets that they have is scarcely uh, the type that uh, we support that, as a rule of law, a structure which has an institutional structure which enables exchange to be viable and production and productivity efficient. Russia has scarcely been able to do that, and I would suggest to you that uh, if the IMF never existed, we'd be looking at very much the same sort of problems that they have. But well, we put $20 billion of IMF money into Russia. My, my next question is, is one that has not been just one more question, Mr. Chairman. I think others have had as much time. And this is a perspective that we're not hearing too much from this committee today. It is, you're true on the perspective. You're true that others have gone over. If, if, we're over about 10 minutes. We have a lot of members. If you could ask it very briefly. So, the, the we've learned recently through the subcommittee that Mr. Backus is the chairman of, and I'm the ranking member, that in fact, despite all the resolutions and amendments passed by the United States Congress, urging the, our representative to the IMF to use his or her voice and vote to protect workers' rights or moral hazard. Guess what? We have learned that our representative never asks for any votes at the IMF, and virtually all of the important decisions are taken without votes. Now, what does this tell about IMF and the Treasury Department's respect for the will of Congress? Mr. Summers, did you want to, or Mr. Let, let, let me, if I could, respond to Mr. Sanders. I, I think, actually, it makes the point in, in the opposite direction that you've suggested, there are very few votes taken. Most of this is resolved through informal conversation and discussion. No, that's precisely the point. And it's voice and vote. And let me assure you that we are exceedingly mindful of Congress's directions with respect to the use of the voice and vote and have used that voice very powerfully in the consultation so that while it is true, relatively few of these decisions reach a vote, we are much more effective on behalf of that which Congress has directed us to do through a consultation process in which we can exercise intellectual and moral suasion than we are in a vote where we're only one of 182 nations, although we, I think, have something like 18 percent of the vote. Yeah, but we have veto power. Can you give us that discussion about our role, or is that closed discussion? Excuse me? Can you provide us that evidence, the testimony about the role that we play within these IMF discussions, or is that closed information? Uh, we would be happy to come and discuss it with you if you'd like. 
but it's secret information. It's not published. Uh, the let me say we are very much in favor of increased transparency in the IMF, if that's your point. We agree with that. <laughs> Thank you. But we're also very happy to come discuss the issue with you. Mr. Lucas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and uh, gentlemen of the panel. I'd like to state for the record, since we're on this topic, that probably contrary